Good morning, everyone. Let us get started. We are going to be talking about how to roll out a content strategy plan across an entire company, team by team, with somebody who has done it very recently and very well in our estimation, Lisa Young from Twitter. Good morning, Lisa. Welcome. Hi there. It's great to be here today. Oh, I'm so excited <laughs> for our conversation. Uh, these webinars are always so much fun. We've got such a great community, a great budding community mm -hmm. of other content strategists. So really excited for the conversation we're yes, gonna have. Yeah. So a little bit of background. Um, Lisa, do you wanna introduce yourself? And sure. Kind of do a little bit of a bio? Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, so as May said, I'm Lisa Young. And I wanted to thank you for joining in the call today um, to talk about building a content strategy practice that supports the needs of your customers and the needs of your business. It's something that's a win for everyone. Um, just a bit about my background. I got my master's degree in professional writing and I studied both composition theory and the integration of ver visual and verbal rhetoric, which means- Oh, I so apropos. Yeah, yeah. It, did, it did work <laughs> out. Actually, I'm doing what I wanted to do. Um, but, and basically that means I spent a lot of time thinking about and learning about how people absorb information and how we can make that easier for them. I began my career in tech writing um, where I spent about 10 years and then for the past eight years I've been uh, focusing on content strategy and UX writing. Wonderful. Um, and you guys know me, I am one of the co-founders of Cordoba and uh, are working really closely with uh, folks on our marketing team to um, really hear the stories and the challenges of folks in the content strategy community and uh, make those kind of the heart of our webinar series. So um, a little bit of housekeeping before we dive into uh, the, the webinar. Uh, we are going to be together for an hour up until noon. You guys are all muted right now, but we are going to have a, a QA at the end. We'll try to do 20 minutes for the QA. So we've got lots of converse, uh, lots of time to dig into um, what Lisa did at Twitter. Um, please use the uh, QA box that is um, in your uh, webinar screen to do that. And we'll be reading out and sometimes consolidating the questions if there are some similar themes. Uh, if you are tweeting and you've got um, you are, your fingers <laughs> handy, um, it would be super appropriate to tweet during <laughs> this webinar. Uh, Lisa is quite active. Um, she's at Jennings, L. Jennings Young, and we are at Cordoba. And we will be sending the webinar recording out later this week um, with a very special exclusive to this webinar um, product sign up link. So I'm excited for that. Okay, and with that, we would love for you to Great. begin. Thank Great, you, okay. Great, so I'd like to start by sharing uh, a belief that I have, a deeply held belief, and that's content strategy is essential for every company that wants to effectively communicate with its customers. In a world of so much noise, we have to be great communicators or nobody hears us. And that includes people inside our organizations. One of our biggest challenges, getting people um, who work you know, under the, within the same walls that we do to believe that content is important and to buy into content strategy and its practices. So the big question is how do we get content strategy, or at least my question is how do we get content strategy to be part of our company strategy? So we have to find out how to cut through the noise in our own organizations to get everyone's buy-in and get everyone using our content strategies and best practices. And there's so many ways to build a content practice. As, as many people as there are on this call as, as there are ways to build the practice. But our job is to show everyone within our organization the path to success. It's to light the way so people understand where we are now, where we want to go, and how we're gonna get there. And, and I'm sure all of you know this very well, that content strategy is an art and a science. And it's one of the hardest things we can do because of all the competition for people's attention. And lots goes into providing people with the right info at the right time and the right place. So to meet this challenge, content strategy has evolved, uh, especially over the last couple of years, into a highly specialized discipline. And it's more than just supporting the needs of the customers. It's also about the supporting the needs of our business. As a content strategist and copywriter, I draw upon a holistic approach to product content or to product strategy and content strategy that's based on my experience that business problem or that content problems are often business problems. No, I love that. 
Um, and here's a, an example of how I think holistically about content strategy uh, and where I really kind of came to this realization and this holistic approach was I was at a fintech company called Advent Software and I was doing content strategy for their financial data products. And, and one of our content problems was that our customers were con uh, constantly confused about the plethora of our data products and services. What did each one do? How did they all fit together? So my starting place was a, a massive inventory and audit of all the content for our data products across the customer journey, starting with pre-sales, sales enablement, or sales enablement, marketing, technical writing, and then getting all the way to the support materials. And what I found was that at any particular stage, the customers could meet a different advent, well, different voice, uh, different terminology, value props, even sometimes different names for the same products. It was confusing. So yes, it was a content problem, but it was also a business problem resulting from the software products being developed, marketed, sold and sometimes supported by different business units. So I proposed their current branding, which is Advent Data Solutions, and it drew together seven um, distinct data products under that single umbrella. It unified our content strategy. So instead of add-on products being developed, um, or, or, but it unified our content strategy, but also resulted in a more holistic approach to our business processes. And within a year and a half or two years, we had a single business unit called Advent Data Solutions. Awesome. And instead of those add-on products being developed, marketed, sold, supported, we, all these different um, teams and business unit, units, we had one business unit, Advent Data Solutions, uh, one team, one unified product and content strategy. So we had a clear path to success for both our customers and our business. I love that. Content strategy is business strategy. So here are the three stages I want to share with you today about how I've created that clear path. One, um, establishing your purpose and getting buy-in. Next is building your strategy and then rolling it out to your organization. And the first step um, in building that path, so is establishing your purpose and getting buy-in. Here's a quote that really changed the way I think about my job and my work within an organization. And it's by an amazing content strategist, Rick Allen from ePublish Media. He specializes in um, content measurement and analytics. Um, and what he said at a, a workshop I had with him was no clear purpose means no clear value and no way to measure success. So I was hired at Twitter to create a strategy for scaling their content, pra the content practice in our design org. Um, it would include people as well as processes. So at Twitter, my purpose is building that scalable practice. That's what gets me in my seat every day. I have a single-minded focus, which keeps me on track, but also helps my coworkers understand, um, provide them with insights into why I do what I do and why I don't do other things. So if you're still struggling to find your purpose, or how to articulate your purpose. Here are some of the questions I use to help me think about what I bring to the table in my role. Um, the first one is um, one the one that I wanted to talk about today and, and you can just uh, refer to the rest, but it's really, again, this holistic approach to content strategy. It's connecting those dots between the business activities and those design activities that impact your content. Um, and this is the thing that I love most about this work. It connects the organization's um, content efforts with the business goals and the user needs. So in everything that I do related to content, I really try to make sure it's mapping back to those requirements, business goals and user goals. Um, and I think it's pretty terrific because it means that I get to make friends with just about everyone inside the organization along the way. So the stages for getting buy-in, once you have your purpose, you know, it's time to get buy-in. And these were my stages of getting buy-in for the content strategy at Twitter. I started with my manager. So he hired me to create a st strategy to scale our practice. So this part was easy. Um, then I got an executive sponsor to help with introductions, advise me on things like who to include in reviews and presentations and who not to include. Um, he helped me understand the value propositions 
um, on the Cordoba platform that would particularly resonate with um, different stakeholders and how to make my way through complex processes like um, security risk reviews and um, getting sign off on the PO. Um, aligning with company KPIs, that was one of the things that actually my executive sponsor helped me with. At Twitter, our top KPI is health of the platform. So we made sure from the start that we were thinking about, you know, when we were telling the story, how we would align with um, those top KPIs, especially health. And explain to our listeners what health means at uh, Twitter. Okay. In terms yeah. Of the conversational. Yeah. Great. Health is it is a broad, um, a broad, um, a broad uh, actually swath of the the work we do. Um, it includes things like um, account security, privacy, data protection. Um, identity management, even things which are kind of on the verge of, of health and conversation, like the ability to control your conversation, which is a new feature we just released where you can hide replies and conversations that you start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's basically, it's just about helping people feel safe on the platform and positive. Yeah. And none of those features exist without the content to explain them, which is Absolutely. why the strategy is so important. Absolutely. And in fact, in the health area, content there's more content in that area than anywhere else in the platform. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so then aligning with stakeholders, goals and challenges. So in my work, aligning um, with folks in design and engineering were the most vital. So I built those first. Um, having advocates early on sets the tone for everything that follows and gives, gave me champions in the room when I wasn't there. And then I got in the line with, with other content heavy teams um, that have a stake in product content like marketing, communications, and legal. And I think in all of this, the key is to understand and to be able to demonstrate that you understand the hopes and dreams and challenges or pain points of your colleagues, these other teams that you work with, and to be able to frame your project in terms that resonate with them. Um, and this frame is often going to be different than yours. So really having that empathy um, um, helps with that conversation. Cool. Um, I have a question around the executive yeah. sponsor because I, I love, and that's very practical and very specific mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, piece of advice yeah. uh, when kind of get buy-in is quite general, um, which is fantastic for, for listeners. Mm -hmm. How did you know you needed an executive sponsor? Mm -hmm. How did you and presumably your manager yeah. identify that yes. person? Yeah. Um, and then what was you know, kind of maybe counterintuitive or things that surprised you around what that executive sponsor was able to do for the strategy? Okay, sure. Um, so my manager, Brian Haggerty, he's an amazing design manager at Twitter. He helped me, um, he helped put me in touch with Giles. Mm -hmm. And um, for a couple of reasons, um, because um, this particular uh, director, design director, Giles, really appreciates content. Um, and, you know, at Twitter in general, pe people appreciate content, but he has a specific passion for it. And also, um, in his previous role at Google, he experienced some of the, and had talked previously about some of the challenges that they had at Twitter. And so Brian thought um, that this strategy would resonate with him. Great. What was your second question? Um, the second question was around, um, you know, what uh, cross-functional doors were opened oh, because you didn't have sort of a generic executive team, executive team that was mm -hmm. excited about because you had one kind of advocate yes. sponsor. Yeah, exactly. Because what I think is so cool about what you were able to do and, you know, product design is no small team at Twitter. I mean, yeah, you guys run the place. Exactly. Um, but you were really able to, from a seat on the design team, really bring a bunch of teams right. on board to the strategy. Right. So what was the executive sponsor's role in yeah. helping you make that happen? Um, one thing is getting meetings on people's calendars. Mm -hmm. That's hard to do, <laughs> yeah, right, for, work, for executives. Sure. It's like, yeah, and also telling me um, who doesn't need to be included in, in, in an invite. Mm -hmm. Super important. Um, and he also helped me um, roll up Again, the, the ideas of the things that excite me about Cordoba and what we can do with the content aren't necessarily the things that are gonna be the most exciting to an engineering team. So mm -hmm. to help me really tailor the story so that I was um, talking about the benefits to different, different teams as it would really resonate with yeah. them. Cool. Um, and then the idea of rolling up to um, the health KPI. KPI. 
that was his suggestion and it was a great one. Great. Why did you start with engineering? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> engineering is, um, they hold the keys in a lot of organization to publishing content, mm -hmm. um, as they do at, at Twitter. And I, um, I learned, um, early on working in engineering led companies that the, um, the content work is not their favorite piece, <laughs> you know, cutting and pasting and putting into the code or into the strings is not their favorite. And um, doing that kind of work um, like um, isn't, it takes a lot of the time, it takes it away from other priorities. So I have a, um, a, a story I could share. This is again when I was at Advent and I brought on a, a, a content platform for onboarding. And I was super excited about it because it would be finally a chance that we could holistically like fine tune our brand voice, like move the whole content system. Because you have access to the content itself. Exactly. Yeah, we could, we could fine tune. Um, we could look at our lexicon, make it much more, um, you know, specific, specific and, and consistent. But this wasn't necessarily what um, resonated with my engineering partner. And I remember he said to me, least this isn't poetry mm -hmm. which like you know put a dagger in my heart you know when and you I talk to him about the brand voice part <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 it's like this is not poetry least um and I could have spent months trying to convince him otherwise like poetry like you know, like great UX writing like poetry makes it abstract concrete it I uses deliberate and intentional language and it allows you to do more with fewer words right uh, it motivates and encourages action, but that never would have mm -hmm. <laughs> changed his mind or brought him on board. But so at, at that time, I worked with my executive sponsor, who was an engineering manager, a uh, vice president in engineering, who helped me craft the business case um, around this idea of what would resonate with engineering. Um, Advent's a very engineering-led company, which is um, the ability within that platform to separate the content layer from the application layer. So Giving we them time. Totally saving them time and some really, you know, unsatisfying work, you know, yep. copying, pasting and pushing and looking for errors. Yeah. It's not what engineers are there yeah. for. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Thank you. Um, so next one is building your strategy. Um, to start, here are some of the things that I thought about at Twitter when we were building our strategy. Um, and and these are some of the things you may want to think about too. I'm sure you'll have many others, but writing guidelines obviously has to be there at the top. Something that I'm really passionate about and I've done a lot of work in, which is structure. Um, I mean, those metadata and tags so you can um, efficiently, efficiently manage your content over time. Um, the ability to easily uh, inventory and audit. That, that inventory and audit I talked about at the beginning was manual. It was mm -hmm. very time consuming, done in the spreadsheet, and I don't recommend it, but you know, when you're thinking about this, an ability to easily inventory and audit. Collaboration tools, separating that content layer, we just talked about that from the app layer. And then of course, going, again, going back to Rick Allen's quote, the ability of the plan from the very start for measuring success. So at Twitter, here's where I started thinking about a strategy, a new strategy for our product content. And I started with elevating um, our impact on the user experience. Like how could we elevate that impact, but also simplify the way that we worked. During my interview, I asked my now manager uh, about what he thought was the biggest challenge to solve in, in Twitter design for content. And from the start, it was uh, always in his mind, taking better control of our words so we could deliver more impactful content at scale. And it was really about the scaling. Um, so then we discussed what it would look like to hit, hit it out of the park within the first year. So I listed on this slide some of the ways um, that, that would look like, some of the things we could do, like streamlined processes, improved consistency within the content, definitely easier collaboration with stakeholders. Across comms, across marketing, legal. all those, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, and then um, something that was really new and exciting, especially to our legal and compliance people, is a, an audit trail, the ability to see who published what, when, um, and um, be able to go back if you wanted to find um, historical content. Yep. So this is Brain Traffic's content strategy framework, um, which I'm sure many of you have seen. And this is actually their new, um, what they call the new quad. 
Um, and it provided me, it's, it's kind of my North Star, my um, the place I always start with when I'm thinking about my work and all the areas I need to cover, you know, to really have an impactful content strategy. Um, and it turned out at Twitter, the things that we really wanted to do in terms of scaling really fell into the structure and process, which is where Cordoba fits right in. Um, and so we're going to start with structuring. That's going to be the first place we start is with that um, organization for browse and find um, intuitive tags so we can find and reuse our content and efficiently manage it over time. Um, so here's an example of how we're going to start. And as May knows, we're just rolling this out. But we, and, and sometimes like if you're doing content strategy on websites and or lead gen, these things will be things you think about in terms of your users, like finding it on your website. But for us, it's having internal stakeholders, people who are our content friends, who work with us on projects, being able to find the content. Yeah. Your users are the internal folks who are writing, revising, needing exactly. access to content. Exactly, that's how we're, we're using Cordova for that. So um, these are some of our larger product areas uh, and they'll make it easier for people to think, oh, if I'm looking for such and such a piece of content, they might know to go look for it under emails. Right, it's much more intuitive. Oh uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and then in terms of organization, uh, this is something that was really important to designers. Like they're working on a screen and they know they write, work with a content strategist to write something that's gonna work perfectly here. Where is it, in a Google Doc or was that in a JIRA ticket, right? So we're trying to really think hard about intuitive um, metadata that will help you know, design, engineering, legal, go back and find based on an, a, a meaningful organization go out and find that content. And so we're gonna, we'll be going by content types and components, feature sets. Um, I think we're gonna also break it down by what we call client or platform, iOS, Android. Um, and in addition, we'll, we'll start thinking future facing about things like localization, um, experimentation, variants, and things like that in the future. And the last two slides are, are screenshots from your actual documentation yeah, that you guys yes, are using. Yeah, now. exactly. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is just draft here. So it will be changing a lot over time. Um, so it's important to figure out, um, let's see. Oh, then actually before I go to that, I want to talk about the, the structure and process for system science. So this is going to be the second part of what we do after we structure it. We'll be designing our workflows. And obviously our tool is Cordova. We chose that because it does just about everything, if not everything we wanna do under structure and process. But it'll help us move that content through its life cycle. We'll know who's respond responsible and, and accountable. Like right now we'll get messages in Slack, who wrote this, right? <laughs> Which is always like the most thing you don't wanna see in the morning, but- You can't you... guess the tone. <laughs> exactly, is exactly. Who wrote this or who wrote this? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. But we'll be able to see not only who wrote it, but who approved it, yeah. right? Who reviewed it? Who was that content team? Um, so um, let's see. So then let's get to knowing your, um, knowing your numbers. Um, the goals, criteria, and metrics. So this is something I wanted to make sure we talked about early on and, and I talked with um, um, Emily, our success manager from, for Cordoba about, from Cordoba about this. Twitter's huge on data analytics and so I wanted to have an idea from the very start how we would show um, our impact on the organization. So there's three things we're going we're gonna to be measuring is we'll start with the baseline um, metric for when we upload all our initial content, what our initial score was um, globally, looking at all our content on the system. Again, that's, again, what do we have and how well does it adhere to our standards? And then our next two, we'll be able to see a percent improvement when we start uploading new content. Um, after we become familiar with the system and everyone's on board with the writing, reviewing process. And then lastly, we're going to try to measure um, the increased speed by which we can push copy into our product. And that will be, probably be a mixture of online and offline measurements. And um, I'll be working with, with you all to figure out how we can really get a, a number on that. But this is the thing that really um, excites 
you know, people with, especially in management, it's like when you can demonstrate with numbers, the impact you've made. So I'm excited to um, start putting together you know, recording. this recording yep. for this. Yeah. So during the process of building the strategy, you know, even though you've touched base with people earlier and got alignment and buy-in, it's good to keep going back and touching base with your content friends throughout the whole content strategy building process. Um, and now that you're into it and things are becoming more clear, you've got some artifacts um, and more specific things to talk about, you wanna make sure you haven't missed anything. So that's something I will, um, you know, and through the process of Twitter, I'd go back and ask me, you know, what have I missed? What are some other things that we may be able to solve for that we haven't talked about? So um, as a rule, I recommend you know, checking in with your stakeholders and your content friends um, and involving them not only just early, but continually really does cement that buy-in. Um, and this is something, you know, I wish I could do it. I wish we could all do it all and at the same time, but it's just not possible. Um, and these are some of the projects I haven't been able to work on yet, but I do think um, outlining or identifying some of your future facing goals like this are important to think about as you evolve your org's um, content practices. So again, I mentioned this um, a, a couple slides earlier, but some of the things we're, we'll be doing sooner and then some of them a little later is like the, the integration with design tools like Figma, maybe January, February, um, proprietary analytics dashboards. That would be amazing if we could go into some of the, um, you know, put stuff into the um, Twitter dashboards. Localization, translation, Personalization would be amazing, um, accessibility, and then we do tons of experimentation with our, with our content at Twitter, and to be able to have managed those different strings or those different words in the platform in the future would be pretty amazing, but not today. <laughs> um, and then rolling out the strategy. I always like to say content strategy is a team sport. It's not something that any of us can do alone, and ultimately, I mean, in my experience anyways, my content product is only as good as the teams that we work with. Um, so one of the first things that I did at Twitter uh, is shared, uh, publish the strategy in a shared place. So it, people can easily find it and refer back to it whenever they want. Um, I put everything in Confluence, organized, organized around Brain Traffic's content strategy quad, which I, I love. I think I've said that three or four times, but I do love mm -hmm. it. Um, and it, it's working really well for us. And then with that shared strategy, I think it's important to tell your stories. And so these are some draft versions of a belief, purpose, and editorial mission statement. And this is going to change over time, but I wanted to put it out there uh, in Confluence now um, to get in some initial buy, um, to get initial buy-in and just get some feedback. It gives something um, for people to react to. But um, it's hard, you know, it's hard to really, like you think you might be in alignment, but until you put the words down, you're not mm -hmm. exactly sure. So yeah. this has gone through several iterations already. And as we bring in more people, it'll, it'll continue to change. Um, but the thing I found is once you get people um, to participate and help you develop the strategy and feel like owners, it's probably the best way to get them to follow the strategy yeah. if they've been part of building it. Um, Selling collaboration. So as we roll out the plan, um, I, need, I believe in continuing to sell the benefits. Um, it's not just about um, building the strategy together. It's about figuring out how you bring the vision to life across the organization. So this is something that I put on our conflict site on our homepage. Um, and it just helps everybody understand the benefits of working with us and what happens if they opt out. Um, so this is kind of back to Rick Allen's quote. This is about selling our purpose. And you did this um, from a tactical perspective in face-to-face -face meetings. Absolutely. In yeah. walking them through the content strategy center and confluence. Exactly. The tooling. Yep. Yep. All those places, you know, we pin it to Slack and um, in our, well, we'll talk about some of that here, some of the um, uh, other ways we communicate, but through Slack, through office hours. Um, one thing that I'm really excited about is publishing our style guide from within Cordoba. Right now it's in a Google Doc. We're going to be able to put it, you know, once it's finished in Cordoba, publish it so that it's not 
just accessible and Confluence. We'll definitely have a link in Confluence, which is kind of our central hub for all our strategy. But anyone um, on our corporate site, will, I mean, our, our internal site will yeah. be able to find this and use it. The hope is that eventually, you know, the, um, we'll have a more unified um, voice and tone across all of, and language lexicon across all of Twitter content. Um, and then again, this gets back to the idea of continuing to check in with people so they are, feel like they're part of the process and they understand what's happening when and why. But here's an example of the pillars of success that we shared with people and it's on our Confluence site, uh, the pillars of success. So getting that buy-in and alignment is just an ongoing effort and it helps people see that path to success. So for us, it's getting the guidelines into the system, you know, out of our Google Doc and into the system. Um, it's doing that initial inventory and audit. What do we have? How well does it adhere to our style standards? Uh, it's that, that initial upload of all our content, content fine-tuning the scoring. Um, and then for the collaboration stage, when we establish, especially the, um, we want to make sure all the cross-functional stakeholders are involved and set up for success. So um, we'll be meeting with them regularly. We've got all sorts of off, um, offline ways to, to chat with us through docs and conference pages. But we'll be working on our structure and our processes. Um, and then the last, the, the you know, most important thing is that iterate and push and where we can really show that we've scaled our practice through integration with our string center um, and getting the, the words into the products quicker. Um, we talked a little bit about getting people to ask questions and stay involved. And so here's, here are some of the things that I mentioned earlier, that Slack channel. Um, of course, we have JIRA and a, a homepage on JIRA. We have calendar bookings, office hours, and we log our weekly sessions so people can go back and find out what, what we've been talking about and what they might want to talk to us about. Um, and then um, uh, pilot projects. So these were some of the ones, um, these are some of the ways I chose the pilot projects at Twitter. Um, and if you're still trying to find um, the ways, here are some suggestions. And, and really um, is finding those products, projects that align with the company objectives. We talked about that at Twitter, it's health. Finding people who are excited about the work um, and then really starting small to get those quick wins. So at Twitter, we're starting with an account security team because it rolls up to our health KPI. Um, it's a very defined project um, and the team is super excited about Cordova because it's the, the engineering team, I should say, because it's very copy heavy. Mm -hmm. So they're really excited to um, have a different way to work with content strategy. And that's, that's it for me today. Awesome. Um, this was so fun. Um, thank you, Lisa. Really excited for the questions that um, folks on the uh, phone are, are going to have. Would love to walk people through the product that uh, Lisa and team are using uh, as a way to frame um, some of the, the conversation. Um, and then we will get into the Q&A. Um, so we are in Cordova right now. Uh, Cordova is organized around docs, um, which can be uh, both document view and grid view. So the kinds of product content that um, uh, is, is the majority of what Lisa's team is doing um, is in a uh, strings view, uh, but documents live in something called a docs view. Uh, going into um, one of the documents, you see the analysis of the content for brand voice, terminology, writing style. This content is scored and all of these suggestions as well as the score, what comprises the score, what categories are weighted, what is completely customizable um, by, by team and by company. So the style guide is the part of uh, the Cordova product. This is where you can make um, and really instrument the guidelines that Lisa was talking about in terms of um, kind of starting with the um, uh, the structure that folks will be will, folks will be following. Lots of different ways uh, in which to instrument and customize uh, the Cordoba style guide to align with your house style. Uh, in addition to some of the things that come out of the box, um, the ability to um, write. Uh, content that's really specific to uh, what you want the writers on your teams to be doing. Um, 
from kind of messaging to uh, do's and don'ts uh, to tone examples. This is all stuff that can be written in Cordoba and really um, decimated, disseminated to uh, the uh, team. There is um, a personalization and kind of sharing component here. And so um, you can have, this is ours, um, you can have um, your guidelines living um, at a URL that can be protected or, um, or live um, kind of on the web, but really allows folks to um, uh, really quickly put together uh, what the guidelines are and uh, help everybody um, have visibility into that. The ability to uh, integrate with engineering on product UX is um, also a, a big part of the, the product. And so um, this is uh, some of the views that Lisa's mm -hmm. team is, is looking at. And, and this is what um, you can use to kind of tag and um, uh, uh, kind of recombine um, content in a way that doesn't impact engineering flows and the engineers don't really have to worry about it. It's like a UI into the, um, uh, the, the, the code that they need to deploy for the product. And you get all of the same content suggestions um, here as well, all tied to your style guide and your, your terminology. So that's the product in um, a nutshell. Uh, let's move to Q&A and um, mm -hmm. kind of see what the folks on the phone want to ask you about, Lisa. Okay, wonderful. So um, let us start with um, uh, some of these. These are really fantastic. Um, let's start with um, a, uh, a question around um, measuring success. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we can go back to uh, that slide while I uh, read out the question. Um, curious how you decided uh, to measure success for the content strategy, especially content quality versus content creation process. So kind of quality versus process, mm -hmm. uh, measuring the impact of uh, content. So content that's kind of okay or mediocre versus uh, content that's great written in your, your mm -hmm. brand voice, your one voice content. How did you decide what were, what the measures of success were going right, to be? Right. Well, the things that really resonated with people at Twitter from, you know, all across the stakeholders up to, um, you know, senior leadership was really getting a single source for truth um, for Twitter product content, right? They really wanted to know what do we have? And I, I used to say, how good is it? Um, but I, I don't think necessarily Cordoba answers every question about how good it is. There's many other me measurements, but it does definitively answer how well it adheres, you are adhering to your own style standards. Um, and that was pretty exciting for people. So that's where, I mean, there's lots of places we could have started, but that's what resonated with us at Twitter. Right now our content is in, um, you know, it goes from many different sources into the product. So just getting it in one place um, and then also allowed us to um, um, have, um, we didn't have to have all the integrations in and all the teams set up and onboarded and all that. It's something we could do just as writers. When we talk about starting small, that's where we wanted to start. We can, we can do that with just our engineering resource. Cool. Great question. Um, I really like this question around um, how to establish the, the voice and style to begin with. So right. especially given that you um, are, are newer at Twitter, did mm -hmm. you come in with an established writing style, an established tone of voice? Um, how would you have done it if, you know, I actually, right. I don't know the answer. To yeah, this. yeah, no, too. it's, that's a great question. So Twitter has a very, for the, on the marketing side, social media, a very well-defined and a guideline for voice and tone. Cool. Um, human, bold, and electric. Mm, it works that. great there and there's some terrific examples, but it does, when I came, I was the second content strategist um, for um, the consumer side. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing really written out. Everything was in the one amazing content strategist head. Mm -hmm. So trying to, but it's not some, something also that he, 
he really um, he realized that in product writing, and it, it's really not about necessarily being bold and electric. It's about helping people do something quickly, mm -hmm. right? Helping, showing empathy, helping them learn, do, use in the least amount of time, right? So we recognized that we needed to still like while laddering up to the Twitter overall brand voice, we needed to set our own guidelines. So, um, so we're doing that now. And we have a new manager, really excited. She just started this week, who's had a lot of experience in developing brand voice and tone. So we, we have some guidelines that we've come up, you know, as a, a team has grown more than double this year that we're using now. Awesome. Um, and, but we'll, we'll continue to iterate on that. How would you, and this wasn't one that was asked, but um, reading into the question and mm -hmm. knowing a little bit about what you guys are about to go through, um, uh, how does product and marketing share brand voice guidelines? That's on our corporate site. There's a, um, it's actually, um, yeah, it's on um, go brand voice guidelines. <laughs> within our corporate so you guys site. are doing it at the corporate level yeah. and it's rolling down into the teams. Exactly, it rolls down to the teams and, it, and it's great. It's just, we need to be able to fine tune that for different parts of our product, which Cordoba will help us do, you know, have slightly different styles for different parts of our product. Cool. Um, uh, a question around how your organization is structured in, term of, in terms of writers. So mm -hmm. I really like this question. So um, you are the content strategist and your team is content mm -hmm. strategy. Where are the writers writing? Uh, who is writing? Are they professional writers? Mm -hmm. um, does that roll up into you at all from a review process? Talk yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So right, I'm in Twitter design. So the design was design research and content strategy. And so right now we're kind of being made into our own um, pillar within design research and content strategy. And so uh, we have content strategists that work on you know, different you know, consumer and business products and um, but there are content strategists spread throughout Twitter, um, and we haven't up to this date been, you know, really sharing resources, but that's something now that we've got our, uh, a new manager who's going to have the bandwidth for that, we'll be really trying to um, think about how we can do more unification across Twitter. But right now cool. we're focused on product content, or I'm focused on product content strategy. Awesome. Um, uh, there's a set of questions that came together that I really like um, around uh, product content specifically. How do you test content with actual users? Mm -hmm. uh, are you measuring conversion based on content in terms of the, the product? Uh, and then this is unrelated to the first two, but related to some of the other questions being asked. How do you demonstrate the value of content to non-content? So yeah. maybe we'll start with the first couple, yeah. um, kind of measuring conversion based on content and okay. then testing content with actual users. Yeah. So Twitter does a lot of experimentation, just a tremendous amount. So I am working with one team that's focused on returning users. So that's through um, email and through um, our, they have, there's a, a landing page for returning users. And because Twitter is doing, does so much experimentation, it's, it's, like literally ongoing weekly where we have nice. buckets. Um, we'll have a control group, buckets based on a hypothesis. We'll run the experiment for X number of days. And then um, if it works, great, we'll ship it. If not, we'll see what we learned and we count that as super valuable too. It's not every time, it doesn't have to be a success. It just has to be a learn. So what I did when I started working with this team is, is built a confluence page that tracks just the experiments that I work on for content. So before it was like, how would we show um, holistically, because everything is mishmashed up, things that have content and things that don't, what the impact of content was. So I have a page now, try not to duplicate any information with links to the content brief, the experiment brief, the, the dashboard, and whether um, the disposal ship or no ship decision. So now we've had like maybe six, eight months of being able to just look holistically at the experiments that impacted, that content was a part of. And then we can go to the, um, the dashboard. Cool. And so is there a product manager in charge of the experimentation? We just got, there right. was one, and then there was a transition period. So since I've been there, we haven't had one on this team. The designer has been yep. working as doing product manager, but now we have one. So what I'd like to do then is be able to have a, a analytics dashboard separate from the content page. We, we could just tag items as content so we could 
you know, yeah. could be included holistically with the rest of the metrics. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that's nirvana for content strategy, mm -hmm. but unless you are as organized as you are, like there's no way you can do that and have it really mean anything. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the thing. It's like having, we had the data, but we never knew which of the experiments content contributed exactly. to. Yeah. Perfect, mm -hmm. yeah, great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, a, uh, uh, a question that um, I know isn't directly in your um, purview, but I do think it'll be exciting for the audience, it kind of sitting where you sit, mm -hmm. um, telling us what it's like inside Twitter. When writers are writing documentation, mm -hmm. um, how do they get some of the core ideas from engineering? Is there a form formal process for that? Mm. Are there, um, you know, what's, how does Twitter manage that? Because Interesting. You don't, yes. you have technical writers writing the documentation, but they're not the engineers who wrote the API or understand how the right. endpoint works. So is there a formal exchange of that more technical information to the writer? Right. So for me, I can tell you the way I work, because I've mm -hmm. been working on some of the account security, which is more of the technical, is the, um, it's really nice that engineering design, EPDR, Engineering Design and Research, sits on the same floor. So um, it's easy to collaborate in, in that way, and we have many channels for, for collaboration. But um, when I need, you know, the technical, you know, um, materials to back up um, anything, mm -hmm. whether it's a new, a new variable that we're gonna, gonna be included in the language, or what's it about, um, they'll usually send me links to, um, you know, their source documentation. Um, their own are, internal. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. People are always available. And that for, sits in Confluence sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's in a lot of, a lot of Google Docs that yeah. are, would be linked mm -hmm. in a JIRA ticket. Um, or I will do often a pair writing session, which I think is the quickest way to get something done, um, is to sit down with one or two or whoever, the engineer, the product manager, whomever needs to be there. Um, and, um, you know, after doing the research and kind of absorbing the requirements and, you know, what we're trying to achieve for the business, for the user, do some pair writing. Okay. Wow. Pair writing. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard of that before. I love that. Yeah. Actually, I thought I invented it, but I did it. Oh. <laughs> it's like, I was like, oh, I do this thing. No, it's a thing. It's nice. out there. You can actually search it. And it's, it's a great way to go from start to finish in the fastest amount of time. Wow. Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I want to do another webinar on just <laughs> we that. We can do that. Yeah. Because that'll help a lot of people. So on, on that vein, um, or in that vein, how do you coach non-writers on how to properly write product yeah. content? Let's, let's be specific on right. product content. Right. Well, there, and one is one of the um, hugest benefits of Cordoba will be, you know, making it easy for non-writers or non-content strategists. Like everybody writes. At some level, I am always amazed how many people are really good writers whose job it yes. isn't to write. Mm -hmm. uh, so... But um, some of the work I do, you know, I will, I will do pair writing with them. I'll say, just do a, a shitty first draft. And that takes mm -hmm. off a lot of the pressure. It's like, just, just the ideas. It doesn't have to be perfect. And mm -hmm. please don't make it perfect. Um, something else that I learned uh, also the hard way is some, sometimes it's, it's good for people to know that there's a style guide available and that you will be trying to adhere to that because yep. they can get their feelings hurt as we all can you know mm -hmm. you, you're excited to get the review back and then there's a lot of changes but sharing the style guide up front kind of walking people through it and helping people kind of understand some of the the reasoning is very helpful cool um some questions uh on on product and marketing again um just because it, it's it's logical that um the two strategies are coherent. Mm -hmm. Do you have content strategy peers that sit on the marketing side? Yes. Okay. There are. Yeah. Uh, and, and to date we haven't um, done a lot of collaboration, but I, I do hope that changes. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Fantastic. Great question. Um, so right now kind of product and design content strategy is separate from marketing content mm -hmm. strategy. Got yeah. it. And that's both on the consumer side of the house and your business Correct. ad side. Yeah. Cool. Um, and uh, and that a question, uh, your um, poetry example resonated with, with some <laughs> folks. Um, when engineers are shown that the words make a difference, yeah. like the poetry works, yeah. um, are, do they become converts? Uh, are they still skeptics? Um, it gets down to, uh, it gets down to time and, and time and time and how much time there is to get stuff done. So I think people have more and, and less understanding of words and at Twitter people really understand words and their importance. 
but what really makes a difference, what moves the needle is um, in terms of, you know, of, of getting uh, buy-in from engineers to a content strategy is things that removes them from that, um, that copy paste work, you know, from mm -hmm. having to go into the code and look for errors and, you know, make little changes. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I do think, in, you know, metrics is a way because Twitter is a very much also an engineering company, but they see the, the way that words, individual words, just tiny tweaks, even switching word order can change metrics. Mm -hmm. Um, so they are, that's, so I guess I would say besides, you know, um, talking to them about how they can not do words, you know, get, get back to what they really love to do is showing them metrics. That cool. really is the biggest impact. Cool. I love that. Um, now not everybody is going to have that, right? The ability to, whether you know, it's to engineering or to stakeholders yeah, to be able yeah. to show the experimentation, that yeah. even word order impact. Yeah. Right. That takes it. That takes a team. Yeah, that takes that's a team. why when I talk about you know, content strategy is a team sport and my experience, my content is not ever going to be tremendously better than the team that I work with is mm -hmm. because of those things, yeah. you know. Uh, on the, the business significance of the uh, content auditing um, that you are doing and have mm -hmm. done in the past, how were you able to um, kind of show an executive team that doing that audit is oh. going to have, you know, a significant business impact? Oh gosh, impact? yeah, for sure. Um, well, showing them an audit, um, and there are tools that can do automated audits. One is called, it's actually called Content Audit Tool, C-A-T. You could probably mm -hmm. Google that and find it. It does a very quick crawl of just external websites. So if yours is internal or product, it, it wouldn't work for that. But, uh, but showing them, like, for example, when I did the one for Advent, I think it was 75% of the content either could be retired or needed to be updated. Interesting. So that's 75% of the content. And it wasn't like huge, hugely wrong, but that percent of the content could be retired or updated. And then being able to retire content is huge. People, at first it feels scary. Like mm -hmm. when I did that audit, um, one of the things that I really recommend is assigning an owner to each piece of content um, and going not, usually people don't want to own content, especially mm -hmm. if it's historical, it needs to stay up, but it's, they think it needs to stay up, but it's historical. Mm -hmm. But one of my, the things I did was say, okay, um, um, you know, if you want to keep it up, then as an owner, you know, you are the one who's going to need to maintain it mm -hmm. and update it. And all of a sudden it was, okay, well, I guess we could let that go. Yeah. Actually, we can, <laughs> we can let that go. So, so showing, you know, the percentage that needs to be updated, what can be retired and just lightening the load. Um, it's like, you know, you have your closet, you know, stuffed full of things. What do we actually need, right? Now yeah. we only need these five outfits. We can get rid of the rest. It's going to be a lot easier for us to move forward with these five things rather than, you know, 80, you know, different piles of things on the floor. Yeah, very cool. Um, I love this question This just came in. Um, should all content be created equal? So at a lot of consumer companies, um, of which you guys are, are one, of course, a leading one, driving a big part of the um, social conversation, mm -hmm. uh, a small amount of the UI potentially or the onboarding flow or the settings really drive a lot of a high percentage of what the mm -hmm. user is engaged with. Yes. Um, and in your categories, um, they are, I, I love that they're separated by kind of a matrix of where you are in the life cycle mm -hmm. of the consumer, where you are in the product, and mm -hmm. then kind of what platform you're on. Right. Um, are you thinking of, or is there a plan to um, kind of cut across that whole matrix to what, what's, what's really in front of your face mm -hmm. most often? Yeah, we do have, we do consider that for yep, sure. Cool. Cause you can't, there is not time as much as you want for everything, at least not now. So you do have to prioritize. And I think there's different, you know, different ways of doing that. But, but personally it's, um, you know, how important it is, is it like a lot of the stuff around account security onboarding will get a lot of eyes on it. Like mm -hmm. a lot, a lot of people will look at it. Whereas some of the things that are more around, um, some of the more fun parts of Twitter, they don't have as many eyes. They don't have as, mm -hmm. not as many people are concerned that we absolutely get it right yeah. and, 
Um, so it depends where you are in the product for sure. Yeah, there's high stakes and then also kind yeah, of high visibility. Exactly. And those are, there's a Venn diagram, mm -hmm. but those can be separate things. For sure. Awesome. Um, let's have this be our last question since we've got one minute mm -hmm. left. Um, what tools or guidelines have proven to be the most useful for you and the content strategy team at Twitter? Right. Um, Everything that brain traffic does is yeah. super useful. Yeah. Fans yeah, yeah, yeah. Their quad I, I look at a lot, and that just really gets me thinking again holistically about all the things I need to be thinking about from, you know, editorial, user experience, process, and structure. So that's mm -hmm. one of my go-to tools. Um, so many Confab is a huge tool. I go every year, mm -hmm. and I love awesome. what I do there. Do you go to any other events? Um, no, okay. no, because I love that one so much. I should branch out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't yet. Um, and, and and conferences are expensive, right? Absolutely, so, yeah. so and time and, and resources, time and resources, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I'm just as you know, I'm super excited about Cordova. That's going to be really game changing for us. Cool, awesome. Well, we've mm -hmm. uh, loved collaborating with mm -hmm. you as well, and love the way you think about uh, content strategy at um, uh, in product teams. Um, especially, but lots of other things mm -hmm. as well. So um, awesome to have you with it was us. It great to Thank be you here. So Thanks much, everybody for, for joining us. Yes, it was lovely. Thanks everyone.